Welcome to this lecture about zoned HVAC systems. Making zones is an excellent way to improve thermal comfort at the room level and energy efficiency. Up to now, when considering air distribution systems, we looked at central air handling units controlling the complete building. However, you can imagine that not all parts of the building needs the same quantity of heat and cold or even air. In general, there are meeting rooms where groups of people work together, office rooms with not that many people, a restaurant. In educational building, you would have crowded classrooms and almost empty teacher's room. In a hospital, there are operation rooms, treatment rooms, patient recovery rooms, analysis rooms, etc. Even in your home, you may prefer to ventilate, heat or cool different rooms in a different way. Next to the function of the room, also the orientation plays a role. Rooms oriented towards the sun may warm up much quicker than other rooms and need more cooling. Rooms shadowed by trees or other buildings may need more heating. And finally, you may also want to shut down a part of a building when occupancy is low. For instance, during school holidays, many educational buildings are partly closed and only the teachers' rooms are open. You want to be able to ventilate, heat and cool only a part of the building. This will save plenty of energy. It may therefore be much more efficient to divide the building into different zones according to orientation and function. Of course, the ultimate zoning is per room, just like happens in a fully decentral system like on the right. Heat, air and cold are delivered directly to the room through windows, ventilation grills, electrical heater and small room air conditioners. However, the systems that can be used are mostly not very efficient. These room air chillers have a low efficiency, electrical heating uses electricity that is mostly not green, and it may be difficult to ventilate on an appropriate way. But sometimes it can be worth investigating these possibilities of full, fully decentral HVAC. Anyways, mostly the choice is in between these two solutions. A zoned HVAC could look like that. You see now that I have introduced four smaller air handling units controlling each zone of the building. In this case, the air handling unit will operate a vertical zone. Each zone can have its own temperature, humidity and volume flow rates of air, heat and cold. This can improve a lot the thermal comfort and indoor air quality as it is tailor-made to the needs. Sometimes there will be a specific air handling unit for the meeting rooms, for instance, or for the restaurant in the building. It will also decrease the energy use as the ventilation in zones that are not used can be switched off. The same can be done with the hydronic heating and cooling systems, just like the two zones in the hydronic system here. If you place a control valve here, also called a damper, you can switch the zone on or off just like you can close or open a tap. And here too, you can save energy by switching off unused zones. Up to now, we have been using an own type of visualization, but when it comes to HVAC design and operation, we are used to work with process and instrumentation diagrams, PNIDs. They are in general uneasy to read, especially if you are not familiar with them. Let's introduce them now on the simple example of a boiler operating two zones in a building. The first zone consists of rooms 1 and 2, the second zone of room 3. You see here at point 1 the divider where the hot water is divided to these two zones and pumped to the zones. The black triangle is a pump. You see valves further in the ducts to regulate the water flow. It can be switched on or off or in between. The radiators in the rooms are indicated by this resistance symbol in two. Once the water has been cooled down in the radiators, it is collected for both zones here in three. And 
further led to the boiler where it is heated again. On the picture right, you see the ventilation system. In my example, there is only one air handling unit and in the drawing it is split in two parts. The heat recovery between supply and exhaust air is shown above. In my example, there is only one zone for the ventilation and one AHU delivering conditioned air to the three rooms. In the air handling unit, we need a heater, which is a heat exchanger, bringing hot water to heat the air when needed. This heat exchanger is connected to the boiler. For now, we don't look at cooling, just heating. In the end, the boiler must provide heat to the AHU and also to the radiators in the room. The P and ID switch therefore would uh, look like that. Take your time to study it carefully, looking at the directions of the flows. Finally, let's address flexibility and pattern size. In architecture, pattern size plays an important role. Pattern size is about the repetition of modular elements which may give a feeling of balance and makes design, especially industrial and prefabricated designs, more easy. You see left a facade without a clear pattern or sizing, while on the right there is a clear pattern of windows and all sizes are similar. Well, it is the same with the placing of the air inlets and outlets in rooms and the placing of the heating and cooling emitters, the radiators or cool ceilings. Placing them with a repetitive pattern will simplify the design of ducts a lot and will also allow for a flexible building use. What does that mean, a flexible building use? Well. In many buildings, like educational ones or hospitals, the possibility to easily reorganize the indoor space layout is quite important. A company is growing and needs more, more but smaller office space, or they want to change their working way by changing the rooms to an open plan office. In a hospital, they may need to reorganize quite often the size of the rooms, depending on the number of patients or a new specialization has to be hosted, etc. If each time all air and water ducts and emitters have to be changed and relocated, that costs a lot of money, much more than just adding or removing non-load-bearing separation walls. So, in many buildings, a clear pattern of air inlets and outlets and emitters is preferred. You see on the left the floor plan of a certain building with a meeting room on the left. The air ducts, indicated in green, have been placed like that, while the radiators are placed this way. In my example, I only consider the supply ducts and heating emitters, but that's exactly the same for the return ducts and cooling emitters. Imagine now that it is needed to change the floor plan to this one. What happens with my existing radiators and hair ducts and inlets? Well, that's not fantastic. In one room we get twice the needed ventilation air, while in the next one there is no air at all. And the radiators should be moved away as they are now at the place a separation wall should come. So, in the end, it is much better to go for a clear and regular pattern like this one. A pattern size of 3.6 meter is quite common, at least in Europe, so air valves and emitters will be placed each 3.6 meter. In this lecture, we talked about zoned HVAC and saw, the and saw that between a fully centralized system and a fully decentralized one, there are a lot of possibilities to create zones that will help to control better the comfort and the energy usage. These zones offer flexibility in switching on and off parts of the buildings. We also described how the use of pattern size will help in keeping building operation flexible. Finally, we looked briefly at P&IDs. Goodbye and thank you for your attention.